More Saint Stories, 3. Aloysius Gonzaga, 1568-1591. Saint Aloysius was born of a princely family of Castiglione in 1568 near Mantua in Lombardy. As a little boy, he spent some time with his father in the army. As a son of a princely family, he grew up in a royal court and army camps. His father wanted him to be a military hero. When he was thirteen, Aloysius traveled with his parents and the Empress of Austria to Spain and acted as a page in the court of Philip II in Madrid. The more he saw of court life, the more he sought relief in learning about the lives of the saints. His motto was, I was born for greater things. A book about the experiences of the Jesuit missionaries in India suggested to him the idea of entering the Society of Jesus. As when he was twenty, he signed away forever his right to the title and lands of the Gonzagas and became a Jesuit novice. Aloysius spent four years in the study of philosophy and had St. Robert Bellarmine as his spiritual advisor. He fasted, scourged himself, and sought solitude and prayer. But for his own good he was obliged to eat more and to take recreation with the other students. Aloysius loved his mother very much, for she was his first teacher in holiness. In a letter to her he wrote, Most illustrious lady, I beg for you the perpetual grace and consolation of the Holy Spirit. When your letter arrived, I was in this region of the dying, but now for some time I have an aspiration towards heaven, so that we may praise the eternal God in the land of the living. Indeed, I was hoping to have completed this journey even before now. It is charity, as St. Paul says, to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Then, my illustrious mother, you must surely derive joy from the fact that, by reason of your fervor and generosity, God has pointed out true joy to me and given me the security of never losing him. God summons me to an eternal rest in recompense for such a brief and slight labor. He calls me from heaven to the supreme happiness which I have sought with such carelessness and promise the reward for the tears I have so infrequently shed. This will not be a perpetual separation. We shall see each other again in the heaven where we shall be joined with our Savior. We shall praise him with all the powers of our soul, seeing his mercies forever, and enjoy unending bliss. God only takes from us now what he has loaned us previously, with no other purpose but to keep it in surer and safer place and he will furnish us with those joys that we would desire for ourselves. I have willingly written these things because there is nothing more that I could do to show the love and reverence I owe you as a son to his mother. In 1561, a plague struck Rome. The Jesuits opened a hospital of their own where they rendered personal service because he nursed patients, washing them and making their beds, Aloysius caught the disease himself. A fever persisted after recovery, and he was so weak he could scarcely rise from bed. Yet he maintained his great discipline of prayer, knowing that he would die within the octave of Corpus Christi. Three months later, on June 21, 1591, Aloysius passed away quietly as he gazed at a crucifix, where he found strength to suffer. He was only twenty-three years old, he never reached the priesthood. His feast day is celebrated on June 21st. Saint Rose of Lima, 1586 to 1617. Rose de Flores was born in Lima in 1586 and received the name Isabel at her baptism. She was called Rose for her beauty. She came into the world at the time when South America was in its first century of evangelization. Fifty years after the Spanish completed their conquest of Peru's Inca people. Her father was Spanish. Some accounts say her mother was Incan. Rose objected as a child to any mention of her physical beauty because she found praise an obstacle to humility. She is said to have rubbed her face with pepper to produce disfiguring blotches. As a young woman, Rose wished to enter a convent 
what but was prevented by her family. She refused to marry. When her father suffered a financial loss in a mining venture, she took up needlework to help the family. Out of obedience, Rose continued her life of penance and solitude at home as a, ma a member of the Third Order of St. Dominic. Catherine of Siena seems to have been Rose's model. She lived in a small enclosure in the garden. She did handwork, tended the flowers, prayed, and kept up her guard against evil invading her heart. Rose emerged from seclusion around 1614. She lived her remaining three years in the house of a government official. During this time, she set up a room in the house where she cared for homeless children, the elderly and the sick. This was the beginning of social service in Peru. Rose wrote, The Lord our Savior lifted up his voice and said with unparalleled majesty, All must understand that grace comes only after tribulation. They must realize that without the weight of afflictions, they cannot reach the heights of grace. Without the cross, they cannot find the path to attain heaven. A powerful impulse then took hold of me and impelled me to preach the beauty of divine grace. If only human beings could realize the importance of divine grace and how beautiful, noble, and precious it really is, how many riches it contains, and how many treasures of gladness and delight. This is the reward, the ultimate fruit of patience. No person would ever complain about the cross or the punishment that may come, if they knew the scales on which these are weighed for their distribution to human beings. Rose also pointed strongly towards the cross as the source of purity. Her spirituality shows how she wanted and worked for inner purity. Her single desire was to banish self-love from her heart, that it might be filled with the love of Christ. She had so great a love of God that... What indeed sometimes seems imprudent was simply a logical carrying out of conviction that anything that might endanger a loving relationship with God must be rooted out. Rose's spirituality, her obsession with purity of heart, seems strange to many in our day unless it is read in terms of St. Paul's observation. God chose the world's low-born and despised those who count for nothing, to reduce to nothing those who were something, so that mankind can do no boasting before God. God it is who has given you life in Christ Jesus. What might have been a merely eccentric life was transfigured from the inside. We should remember the greatest thing about Rose, a love of God so ardent that it withstood ridicule from without, violent temptations, and lengthy periods of sickness. At her death in 1617, at the age of 31, the city of Lima gave her a heroine's funeral. Prominent men took turns carrying her coffin. Rose is the first saint of the Americas, and her feast day is celebrated on August 23rd. St. Margaret Mary Alacoque 1647 to 1690. Margaret Mary was born in 1647, the fifth of seven children, in the Diocese of Atun in France. She was physically handicapped, but the Blessed Virgin cured her. In thanksgiving, she promised to give her life to God. Her early years were marked by sickness and a painful home situation. The heaviest of my crosses was that I could do nothing to lighten the cross my mother was suffering. When she was seventeen, Jesus appeared to her, just as he was after he was scourged. She decided at once to enter the order of the visitation nuns at Pere le Moniel at the age of twenty-four. A few novice termed Margaret humble, simple, and frank, but above all kind, and patient, under sharp criticism and correction. She could not meditate in the formal way expected, though she tried her best to give up her prayer of simplicity. Slow and quiet, she was assigned to help an infirmarian who was very energetic. 
On December 27, 1674, when Margaret was three years a nun, she received the first of her revelations. The request of Christ was that his love for mankind be made evident through her. During the next thirteen months, he appeared to her at intervals. His human heart was to be the symbol of his divine human love. By her own love, she was to make up for the coldness and ingratitude of the world. By frequent and loving Holy Communion, especially on the first Friday of each month, and by an hour's vigil of prayer every Thursday night in memory of his agony and isolation in Gethsemane. He also asked that a feast of reparation be instituted. Jesus made at least twelve promises to Margaret. Some of those promises are that he would bless those who honor his sacred heart, and that he would give them all the graces they need, and that he would give them sufficient grace to die in the state of grace if they received communion on nine first Fridays in succession. Jesus said to her, Look at this heart which has loved human beings so much, and yet men do not want to love me in return. Through you my divine heart wishes to spread its love everywhere on earth. Like all saints, Margaret had to pay for her gift of holiness. Some of her own sisters were hostile. Some theologians called her visions delusions. Parents of children she taught called her an impostor and an inventor. A new confessor, Blessed Claude de la Colombert, a Jesuit, recognized her genuineness and supported her. Concerning the Sacred Heart of Jesus, she wrote, It seems to me that the purpose of our Lord's great desire that his Sacred Heart be honored by some particular homage is to renew in our souls the effects of redemption. For his Sacred Heart is a never-ending source that seeks to be poured out in hearts that are humble open and completely unattached, so as to prepare them to offer themselves to his good pleasure. This divine heart is an inexhaustible source that gives rise to three continuously flowing streams. The first is the stream of mercy for sinners, which dispenses on us the spirit of contrition and repentance. The second is the stream of charity, which dispenses help on all who are afflicted and in need, especially those tending to perfection, who will find therein the means to overcome obstacles. The third stream dispenses love and light on his perfect friends, whom he wishes to unite with himself, so that they may share his knowledge and his maxims, and dedicate themselves entirely to obtaining his glory in their own individual way. After serving as a novice mistress and assistant superior, Margaret died while being anointed at the age of 43 in the year 1690. Her spirituality can be summarized in her words, I need nothing but God and to lose myself in the heart of Jesus. Her feast day is celebrated on October 16th. St. John Bosco 1815 to 1888. John Bosco was born near Castel Nuovo in the Diocese of Turin, Italy, in 1815. His parents lived on a farm and were very poor. His father died when John was only two. One special virtue his mother taught her three boys was a love of poverty. As a youth, John tended sheep, encouraged during his youth to become a priest, so he would work with young boys, John was ordained in 1841. Several positions were offered, but he felt that being an ordinary parish priest or teaching was not for him. He still wanted to do something for the boys he saw running about the streets of the city, orphans and thieves, because they had to steal to live. Boys who were troublesome to the city and to themselves, but who, John knew, wanted to be good citizens, and so it was that he offered to help a boy who could not serve his mass. The lad came back that night and came again the next week, bringing some of his pals with him. At first they could not quite figure out this big, smiling priest who taught them religion, 
told them stories and did tricks to amuse them, and did not seem to care how much noise they made as long as they were decent. But it was not long before every spare minute Don Bosco had was taken up with the gangs of boys who sought him out. He named his work his Oratory of St. Francis de Sales. The Oratory, there were other boys who objected to the goings-on of Father Bosco and his gang. He was forced to hold his gatherings in the open fields and take his flock of boys, sometimes more than a hundred, to assist at Mass in whatever church they could get into. Within a year, Don Bosco had his boys under a roof, and as people realized that he was doing good for the boys and for the whole city, they began to help. His one house, or oratory, as it was called, grew in a few years to four in the city of Turin. Each was filled to overflowing with boys whom he was educating not only in their faith, but in general knowledge and in the trades. His boys were going out into all walks of life and making good. To all of them, Don Bosco was their hero, and next to him was his mother, whom they fondly called Mama Margaret, who had come to help with the boys to cook and sew and mother them. Out of this beginning, John Bosco founded a religious order in 1859 to carry out his work and establish oratories in other cities. The Society of St. Francis de Sales, or Salesians as they are better known, their activity concentrated on educating and mission work. Later, he organized a group of Salesian sisters to assist girls. John Bosco educated the whole person, body and soul united. He believed that Christ's love and our faith in the love should pervade everything we do, work, study, play. Yet John realized the importance of job training and self-esteem that comes with talent and ability. So he trained his students in the trade crafts, too. In a letter, John wrote, If we wish to show ourselves as the friends of the true good of our students and oblige them to carry out their responsibilities, it is important, above all, never to forget that you represent the parents of these dear youths. It is these youths who have been the tender objects of my concerns, studies, and priestly ministry, and that of our Salesian congregation. Let us regard as our children those whom we must exercise some authority. Let us place ourselves always at their service, like Jesus who came to obey not to rule. Let us abhor anything that might give us the appearance of lording it over them. Let us dominate them only by serving them with greater pleasure. This is how Jesus dealt with his apostles. On January 31st, 1888, John Bosco died. His work is being carried on today in many countries. He was declared a saint by Pope Pius XI in 1934 who himself had been acquainted with him. His feast is celebrated on January 31st. St. John Nauman, 1811-1860 John Nauman was born on March 20, 1811, in what is now Czechoslovakia. After studying in Prague, he came to New York at 25 as a cleric and was then ordained in New York by Bishop Du Bois, in 1840, he entered the Congregation of the Most Holy Redeemer, Redemptorus. At age 29, became the first of his order to profess vows in the United States. He continued missionary work in Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, where he became popular with the Germans. In 1852, at the age of 41, he was ordained Bishop of Philadelphia. There he worked hard for the establishment of parish schools and for the erection of many parishes for the numerous immigrants. The number of pupils in the parochial schools increased almost twentyfold within a short time. Gifted with outstanding organizing ability, he drew into the diocese many teaching orders of sisters and the Christian brothers. During his brief assignment as vice-provincial for the Redemptorists, he placed them in the forefront of the school system. He wrote a catechism which was widely used. While he was Bishop of Philadelphia, 
more than 80 churches were built. John knew eight Slavic dialects and modern languages. He traveled through his vast diocese by canal boat, stagecoach, railway, and on foot in his quest for souls. John was well known for his holiness and learning, spiritual writing, and preaching. When there was a question of dividing the diocese, Bishop Nauman expressed his willingness to resign. He wrote in a letter, I was not a little disturbed by the fear that I had done something that so displeased the Holy Father that my resignation would appear desirable to him. If this be the case, I am prepared without any hesitation to leave the episcopacy. I have taken this burden out of obedience and have labored with all my powers to fulfill the duties of my office and with God's help, as I hope, not without fruit. Indeed, I am much more accustomed to this country and will be able to care for people and faithful living in the mountains, in the coal mines, on farms, since I would be among them. I am ready to go where I may more securely prepare myself for death and for the account which must be rendered to the divine justice. I desire nothing but to fulfill the wish of the Holy Father, whatever it may be. Bishop Nauman took seriously our Lord's words, Go and teach all nations. From Christ he received his instructions and the power to carry them out. For Christ does not give a mission without supplying the means to accomplish it. The Father's gift in Christ to John Nauman was his exceptional organizing ability, which he used to spread the gospel, and above all, his example of simple faith and burning zeal for souls. He died in 1860, performing his duties on October 13, 1963, he became the first American bishop to be beatified. He was canonized on July 19, 1977. His feast day is celebrated on January 5th. St. Marie Bernadette Subaru, 1844-1879 Bernadette Subaru was born on January 7, 1844, near Lourdes in France. Her parents were very poor. Her father was a miller. He lost the mill and had to do odd jobs around town while his wife worked in the fields. At this time, Bernadette was five years old and already looked after the house and cared for her younger brothers and sisters. The family was forced to move to a rent-free room of a dilapidated building which once had been a town jail. It was here that Bernadette contracted asthma in the damp atmosphere of the cell in Lourdes. So she was often sent to stay with friends, the Aravants, in the town of Bouts. There she helped with the housework and tended the sheep in the pasture. In return, she received her board and lodging. In the evening, Madame Arvrant taught her catechism, the only education she ever received. In 1858, the Virgin Mary Immaculate appeared to Bernadette within the cave of Massibiel near Lourdes, Later, as a nun, she wrote a letter describing the experience. I had gone down one day with two other girls to the bank of the river Gave, when suddenly I heard a kind of rustling sound. I turned my head towards the field by the side of the river, but the tree seemed quite still, and the noise was evidently not from there. Then I looked up and caught sight of the cave, where I saw a lady wearing a lovely white dress, with a bright belt. On top of each of her feet was a pale yellow rose, the same color as her rosary beads. At this I rubbed my eyes, thinking I was seeing things, and I put my hands into the folds of my dress where my rosary was. I wanted to make the sign of the cross, but for the life of me I couldn't manage it, and my hand just fell down. Then the lady made the sign of the cross herself, and at the second attempt I managed to do the same, though my, hand were, though my hands were trembling. Then I began to say the rosary, while the lady let her beads slip through her fingers without moving her lips. When I stopped saying the Hail Mary, she immediately vanished. 
I asked my two companions if they had noticed anything, but they said no. Of course, they wanted to know what I was doing, and I told them that I had seen a lady wearing a nice white dress, though I didn't know who she was. I told them not to say anything about it, and they said I was silly to have anything to do with it. I said they were wrong, and I came back next Sunday, feeling myself drawn to the place. The third time I went, the lady spoke to me and asked me to come every day for fifteen days. I said I would, and then she said that she wanted me to tell the priest to build a chapel there. She also told me to drink from the stream, and I went to the cave, the only stream I could see. Then she made me realize that she was not speaking of the cave, and she indicated a little trickle of water close by. When I got to it, I could only find a few drops of water, but only... At the fourth attempt, was there sufficient for any kind of drink? The lady then vanished, and I went back home. I went back each day for fifteen days, and each time, except one Monday and one Friday, the lady appeared and told me to look for a stream and wash in it, and to see that the priest would build a chapel there. I must also pray, she said, for the conversion of sinners. I asked her many times what she meant by that, but she only smiled. Finally, with outstretched arms and eyes looking up to heaven, she told me she was the Immaculate Conception. During the fifteen days she told me three secrets, but I was not to speak about them to anyone, and so far I have not. Bernadette died, worn out with physical suffering, on April sixteenth, 1879, at the age of thirty-six. Now her incorrupt body can be seen as she lay in death in the side chapel of the Mother House of the Sisters of Charity at Nivers, where she lived and died as Sister Marie Bernard. Thirty years after her death, her body was found in a perfect state of preservation, undoubtedly a token of the love of the Immaculate Virgin Mary. She was beatified in 1925, and on December 8, 1933, she was canonized by Pope Pius XI. Her feast day is February 18th. St. Francis Xavier Cabrini, 1850 to 1917. Francis Xavier Cabrini was born in Lombardy, Italy in 1850, one of 13 children. When she was 18 years old, her poor health kept her from entering religious life. She helped her mother and father until their death and then worked on a farm with her brother and sister. A priest asked her to teach in a girls' school. She stayed there for six years, refused admission to the religious order, which had educated her to be a teacher. She began charitable work at the House of Providence Orphanage in Cadogno, Italy. In September 1877, she made her vows there and took the religious habit. When the bishop of the Diocese of Lordi closed the orphanage in 1880, He named Frances Prioress of the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart. Seven young women from the orphanage joined with her to help poor children in hospitals and schools. Since her early childhood, Frances had wanted to be a missionary in China. She wrote to Pope Leo XIII, who told her, Go to the United States, my child. There is much work awaiting you there. She came to the United States with six sisters in 1889. She found disappointment and difficulties with every step. When she arrived in New York City, the house that was to be her first orphanage in the United States was not available. The archbishop advised her to return to Italy, but Frances left the archbishop's residence all the more determined to establish the orphanage, and she succeeded. She began working among the Italian people of New York and became an American citizen. In 35 years, Francis Xavier Cabrini founded 67 institutions dedicated to caring for the poor, the abandoned, the uneducated, and the sick, seeing great need among Italian immigrants who were losing their faith. She organized schools and adult education classes. As a child, She was unable to overcome her fear of water, 
Yet despite this fear, she traveled across the seas more than 30 times. Her missionary zeal also led her to Central and South America, where she founded schools in Argentina, Brazil, and Nicaragua. After 28 years of missionary work, she died of malaria in her own Columbus Hospital in Chicago on December 22, 1917. On July 7, 1946, she became the first United States citizen to be canonized. On that occasion, Pope Pius XII said, Although her constitution was very frail, her spirit was endowed with such singular strength that, knowing the will of God in her regard, she permitted nothing to impede her from accomplishing what seemed beyond the strength of a woman. Without doubt, all that Frances accomplished was the result of her faith, which always reigned fervently and vigorously in her heart and the constant prayer with which she penetrated to and obtained from God, with whom she was always closely joined, that which human weakness could not obtain. Even in the midst of the most assailing cares and anxieties of life, she strove and aimed towards this without permitting anything to turn her away, to please God and to work for His glory. To this end, nothing seemed for her laborious, nothing difficult, nothing beyond human strength, aided by grace. The feast day of Mother Cabrini is on November 13th. St. Therese of the Child Jesus, 1873 to 1897. Teresa was born January 2nd, 1873 in Alençon, France. Louise Martin, her father, and Zélie Gurin, her mother, had both aspired to the religious life in their youth, but God had other designs for them. He blessed their happy union with nine children. Of these, four died in their infancy. Five entered the cloister, and the father and mother were worthy examples of true Christian parents. Every morning they assisted at Holy Mass. Together they knelt at the Holy Table. To be a spouse of Christ had been Therese's ardent desire since the early age of three. When she was nine, and again when ten years old, she repeatedly begged to be received into the Carmel of Lisieux on a pilgrimage to Rome with her father. She begged this favor of the Holy Father, Pope Leo XIII. Well, my child, you will enter it if God wills it, responded Pope Leo. When Therese had completed her fifteenth year, the door of the convent finally opened to her. There the superiors put her virtues to the sharpest test. On January 10, 1889, she was invested with the holy habit and received the name of Sister Therese of the Child Jesus and of the Holy Face. She pronounced her holy vows on September 8, 1890, and with all the fervor of her naturally ardent temperament, she gave herself to the practice of the interior life. On the path of spiritual childhood, of the love and confidence, she became a great saint. Therese's zeal for the conversion of sinners and for the sanctification of priests, the special aim of the Carmelite vocation, became more and more fervent as she tested the chalice of the Passion. She suffered much during her life, but it was hidden suffering. She writes, I know of one means only by which to attain perfection, love. Let us love, since our heart is made for nothing else. We must adhere to this simple and only word, love. I will that creatures should not possess a single atom of my love. I wish to give all to Jesus, since he makes me understand that he alone is perfect happiness. All shall be for him, all and for him alone. The good God, she said, does not need years to accomplish his work of love in a soul. Love can supply for length of years. Jesus, because he is eternal, regards not the time, but only the love. And love, indeed, did supply for years in St. Therese's case, for God took her in the springtime of her life, but by means of love she had, in that short space, attained a very high degree of sanctity. Two of Therese's sisters had joined the Carmelite community previously to her entrance, 
yet she seldom sought the pleasure of their companionship at recreation. On the Feast of the Holy Trinity, June 9, 1895, an interior inspiration urged her to consecrate herself to divine love as a sacrificial victim, that is, to offer herself to endure for love of God all sufferings and pains with which divine love desired to favor her. With these sentiments she bore all her interior and exterior trials, and God alone knows the extent of her sufferings. Shortly before her death, Therese wrote, I feel that my mission is about to begin, my mission of bringing others to love our good God, as I love him, and teaching souls my little way of trust and self-surrender. I will spend my heaven in doing good upon earth. Her mission is to teach souls her way of spiritual childhood. She practiced all the virtues of childhood, but those which attracted her above all were the confidence and tender love which little ones show towards their parents. Love, confidence, and self-surrender are the keys to her spiritual life. On September thirtieth, 1897, Therese, the true victim of divine love, died of tuberculosis, a disease which, in her case, had assumed a very painful character. A moment before she died, the patient sufferer once more made an act of perfect resignation, and with a loving glance at her crucifix said, Oh, I love him. My God, I love you. She was twenty-four years old when she died. Sister Therese was canonized only twenty-eight years after her death. She was declared patroness of the missions. Her feast day is celebrated on October 1st. The End the next book we will be reading is short stories by O. Henry. They're, most of them are comic stories, and they're short. And each of them kind of end with a twist or a surprise. Join me for that next.